Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this afternoon's presentation, Who's Winning the Battle of the Pharmacy Titans? We're going to take a deep dive into the numbers of Clicks Group and Dischem Pharmacies. They both reported to the end of August, full year numbers for Clicks and an interim result for Dischem. We will adjust the reporting periods to make things as comparable as possible. But of course, the big factor that we can't adjust for is Dischem's first time reporting under IFRS 16, which Clicks will implement in its February 2020 interim result for the first time. Management has said it will give us a first look at the impact in the AFS, which will be out soon. Please take a moment to read through the disclaimer while I talk through a few housekeeping things. Firstly, there is a copy of the slide pack available for you to download and keep below. Secondly, please type any questions you have into the chat box and I'll stop to answer them from time to time. Right, so let's get into it. We're going to compare the clicks and discam results for the six months to August, so far as we can given the IFRS 16 inconsistency. Clicks reported a full year result, so the numbers we're going to look at pull the second six months out of the annual numbers to make them more comparable. In Discam's case, the implementation of IFRS 16 is earnings dilutionary for the first six and a half years, but it has restated the base, so the growth rate should be reasonably comparable at least. Then we're going to look more closely at how exactly Clicks managed not just to post positive earnings growth, but managed double digit growth in the toughest consumer environment we've seen since 1999 to 2001. Next, we're going to focus more closely on Discam and unpack why there are more fundamental issues at play than the once off effects of a strike on both its retail and wholesale businesses. And then a couple of bonus topics for you. I think investors often think these are both pharmacy retailers operating identical business models, but the underlying differences are quite important and we need to be clear on what those are. And then Discam spent a lot of time in its result presentation alluding to the potential of NHI to drive sales. So I have a few pointers for you to ponder and bake into your investment thesis. But now let's get into it. So we are going to work through the result for the two pharmacy retailers for the six months to August and look at the separate outcomes for their retail and wholesale businesses. Before we get there, just to re-emphasize some of the things that muddy the waters. Firstly, these results are not using the same accounting framework. Discam has now adopted IFRS 16, the standard that does away with the distinction between operating and finance leases, and Clicks result uses the IAS framework for the last time. While there are metrics that require 12-month data, such as trading densities and stock turn, we have used the actual 12-month rolling numbers. Right, here are the high-level review of both groups' results for the six months to August 2019. Clicks group's result was almost unbelievably good. I've mentioned before that it seemed to defy economic gravity. Its H2 diluted HEPs increased 20%, uh, DPS was up 17.8%, group sales growth accelerated to 8.2%, the gross margin expanded by 10 basis points despite the very promotional competitive environment, and this together with strong growth in other income saw the total income margin up to 27.5%. Net finance income also grew nicely to 26.4 million rand, and the group remains ungeared. Pre-tax profit was up just under 19%, and the tax rate was slightly up, so attributable earnings increased 18.5%. In contrast, Discam's income statement was awash with red ink. Diluted HEPs fell 40%. Even without the once-offs in both years, the decline would have been down 30%. And in line with this, the DPS declined 38.2%. Management seemed far more focused on what the top line did than the bottom line. Sales growth was strong at 13.2%, with the Quinette's acquisition in the wholesale business boosting growth there. Its total income margin declined to 27.5% from 29.4%, but this was partly due to it slowing down new purchases once it no longer needed the inventory buffer to trade through the strike. One key difference between Discam and Clicks is the gearing, and Discam's interest bill crept up, but it looks as though the underlying number was stable year on year if you strip out the effects of the strike, the new EPSA facility, and the 7.6% increase in the finance lease payment to related parties. Now let's look at the two retail divisions as standalone businesses. The first point is that both groups are being aggressive in opening new space. Certainly Discam is more aggressive, but Clicks opening 7% more space is hardly conservative. And this is completely unique in South African retail, as most other listed players are actively reducing space, or at least opening very few new stores and in an economy that is flatlining. 
So corporate pharmacy is growing, not because it exists in a parallel universe, rather it is benefiting from the contraction and consolidation of the independence. And this is likely to continue for at least the next three years, setting the scene for ongoing store rollout by these two groups. Let's look across the metrics to compare and contrast. So sales growth for the two was very similar, and bearing in mind that neither is a small business. Also within the clicks number is an 11.7% fall at Musica. The Clicks Pharmacy share was 24.9%, while Dischem was at 23.6%. So between the two, they are now close to half the market. Both groups delivered good like-for-like -like sales growth in the context, but Clicks did better with slightly lower inflation of 2%. This left its implied like-for-like -like volume growth at pretty much double the level of Dischem's. And maybe most tellingly, Clicks disclosed trading density improved over 2%. For the first time since listing, Dischem didn't disclose its trading density but I estimate it declined around 2.4%. Right, moving on to the income statement for the six months. Both retail divisions experienced gross and total income margin squeeze. So Click's improvement in the group level metric was a result of a portfolio shift as a higher margin retail business grew sales ahead of UPD. But the contrast comes at operating margin level. Clicks managed to maintain its operating margin despite a poor performance from Musica. And if you go to the second decimal point, it is actually slightly up, which resulted in pre-tax profit growth of 12.3%. In contrast, Dischem Retail's pre-tax profit declined 26.5%, as there was severe gross margin erosion, which management ascribed to the not buying stock in after the strike, as they ran down inventory, and so they did not receive volume rebates and other supply incentives. The combination of the lower gross margin and rising operating costs plus a higher interest bill, saw the pre-tax margin down to 4.8% from last year's 7.5%. So you might be looking at this and wondering what this means from a wholesale perspective. Let's look more closely. The wholesale businesses were both under significant pressure in clicks at, in the fine picking space. Clicks' gross margin declined to 0.8% from 1% last year, and Dischem's gross margin declined to 7.2% from 8.3%. But Click's focus on the bulk distribution business paid off in terms of a massive increase in the other income line. And so we saw the total income margin increase to 8.4% and the operating margin at 3.6%. This remains above their medium term guidance and they have not adjusted the medium term guidance and we saw pre-tax profit increase by 24%. In contrast to Dischem, uh, the operating profit remained negative, pre-tax margin as well, and in fact, the, the loss increased by over half compared to last year. Right, let's look more closely at how Clicks managed to do this positive operating leverage. So here I've tried to distill the levers down to their most basic form. I've calculated the weighted average total income per square meter. So just to remind you, total income is gross profit plus other income. In Click's case, this improved 1.6%. And now for the secret sauce. We know Clix is relentless on costs, but every time I think there is no more fat to cut, somehow they find it. In this last year, the total operating cost per square meter was up just 1%, which is pretty incredible if you think about staff, where other retailers are bemoaning the effect of labor law changes, forcing them to employ more full-time staff with benefits. So the retail business's operating profit per square meter grew 3.6%. This strips out the effects of new space and gives you a clear view on whether underlying profitability is improving or not. Then at group level, UPD's new contracts helped. And remember, there is leverage there as the cost base is fixed. And then the increased interest earned added another 2% to earnings growth. So no magic rabbits pulled out of a hat, but a clear strategy executed relentlessly over a long time now. Let's see what was different at this game. Dischem's operating profit per square meter is almost a mirror image of Clicks. Here, total income reduced 3.9%, while operating expenses increased 4.4%. And don't underestimate the negative leverage. Operating profit per square meter fell 26.3%. Even if you split out the one-offs, it was still down 22%. So let's just take a step back and look at what goes into Dischem's high trading density. In FY 2019, it was around 94,000 per square meter. This map comes out of the Disc Game Integrated Report, and it shows that the relatively large number of high trading density stores in Gauteng skew the group number. 
and with the exception of Mpumalanga, the poorer provinces have lower densities, although this may also reflect stores that have not yet matured. Why is this important? Because DISCHEM's white space gro store growth strategy is aimed at second tier cities and towns which are less affluent. And so it's possible that the group's initial expectations of trading densities and new stores are not being met. But there are two other possibilities. Firstly, the gross margin may not be panning out the way management expected. It's possible that dispensaries are a much larger part of the mix in smaller towns, and this is much lower margin at gross level than front shop. And then the front shop mix may also be different, meaning that the gross margin is also a little bit lower. The last part of the equation is around store costs. The group fully expected these white space stores to have lower trading densities, but it also expected costs to be lower. It's likely rentals are in line with what we're seeing across the sector, but the key question is around labor and whether formalizing casual labor has added to store costs. So where does that leave us with the distribution businesses? All right, let's start with Clicks Group's UPD business. It is increasingly pursuing scale as it grows its third party bulk distribution contracts. Admittedly, these are higher risk as they come up for renewal every few years and new income is patchy. But the benefits are that it is a steady stream, assuming that volumes don't fall off a cliff, and it helps UPD leverage its return on investment. Clix has taken a very different approach to Dischem. The group owns all its DCs, and the ungeared balance sheet shows that it has paid the cash cost of this already, although clearly there is an annual depreciation charge that goes through the income statement. But these leases will fall outside of the IFRS 16 net, as there is no finance lease attached. In contrast, CJ distribution is largely an internal Dischem supply chain at this stage. The external service is focused on fine picking supply to independent pharmacies, and its numbers imply that it just doesn't have the scale needed to make an economic return on investment. Before listing, the group implied that it intended to pursue third party bulk distribution contracts, but these don't seem to have materialized so far, and that may be related to the detail disclosed in the 2019 integrated report that it has not received all the wholesale pharmacy licenses that it had applied for. In contrast to UPD, CJ Distribution has also acquired some smaller distribution players, like Quinette's, instead of building its own capacity entirely from scratch. But as the two strikes last year show, this hasn't been without its challenges. Then lastly, there is the detail that doesn't own its DCs, rather it leases them from third parties connected to senior disc care management. And the leases do not appear to be market related. The notes in the interim accounts apply that the yield on these leases is 14.2%. Okay, are there any questions so far? No, all right, let's move on and look more closely at the business models. In very broad brushstrokes, Clix competes on convenience with over 700 relatively small stores, while Diskim is mostly about big boxes, although it is opening smaller formats where those are more appropriate. Clix value positioning means it has relatively broad appeal and has targeted the LSM 6 to 10 market. Historically, Diskim has focused more narrowly on the LSM 8 to 10 market, but this now seems to be changing as it executes on its white space strategy. And then the distribution strategies are also quite different as UPD grows its bulk distribution business, while CJ distribution remains largely a fine pick business. Then I just want to finish up with a few comments on NHI, as Diskem Management spent a lot of time talking about the upside potential in its result presentation. So to be clear, yes, NHI is a cornerstone of ANC policy, and the machinery is in place to begin implementing. But I think we have to be clear that this is not going to happen immediately. The medium term budget policy statement is factoring in NHI budget from the 2025-26 financial year. Having said that, I think the MTBPS showed quite clearly that there is a question mark over whether or not South Africa can implement or not. We are assuming that Moody's will downgrade South Africa at the end of February next year, and that puts us into new territory in terms of post-democracy financial management. But leaving that aside, let's look at how the pharmacy retailers could be part of the system. So clinics appear to be the anchor for healthcare service delivery under NHI. And theoretically, this is a positive as it will drive footfall to the stores. And as we've seen that dispensary pulls people in and then they tend to add some front shop product to their baskets, this could help sales too. But there will be other dynamics at work. It is possible that overcrowding of clinics could push existing customers out of the store, either to competitors or to shift their purchases online. And while online means that the group retains the customer, it will leave it invested in costly infrastructure and duplicating the cost of serving the customer. Secondly, we won't know for sure how much new customers attending clinics will buy before or after their appointments, but this is impossible to ascertain until we're there. And then lastly, while I can see the benefits of the pharmacy clinic and an NHI framework for the country, 
I'm not clear on how DiscCare makes money on a standalone basis. We don't know whether or not the clinics are currently profitable, and there seems to be a shortage of nurses similar to the pharmacist shortage that plagued the industry 10 years ago. Right, let's finish up now. Right, so pharmacy retail is a growth market in a country where growth is hard to find. Pharmacy spend is growing ahead of the average, and there is a defensive element, but the consolidation of the independent sector is also a material driver. Clicks is a top quartile player on any metric of margin or returns when you compare it to global players, so Diskim's apparent underperformance should be looked at in that context. I am cautioning you against building massive NHI upside into your short-term investment case. I suspect that many people don't fully understand just how tight the national budget is and the potential downside risks to GDP growth. Right, are there any final questions? Okay, there's one here about the scheme's governance. To be clear, the notes to the interim results imply that the interest rate on the finance leases paid to third parties is 14.2%. This doesn't appear to be market related when you look across the property companies. But you have to remember where Discam came from. It was a private entrepreneur-led business, and in that case, it's easy to see why management blurred the boundary between themselves and the business. The problem is when this happens in the listed space and prejudices minority shareholders. To be clear, this is not illegal, and there are examples of other listed companies that have similar structures. One example is, is value. Aside from this, Discam does wonderful work in its social investment, with things like its food garden, the Million Comforts campaign, and a wide variety of donations. So the leases are important, but this is quite easy to fix. We could just reprice them as they did before listing on the old finance lease. So are there any more questions? All right, thank you all very much for your time and attention and enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Goodbye.